Um, I'm Dr. Gabriela Lemus. I'm the Executive Director of Maryland Latinos Unidos, and I'm really excited to be hosting uh, that Maryland Latinos Unidos is hosting uh, this discussion on immigration. Um, it's clearly uh, uh, something that impacts uh, our state and, um, and to a certain extent, each and every one of us. Um, you know, this is a country of immigrants and our, our history is one of welcoming um, those who are seeking the new opportunities, those who are seeking, you know, freedom from fear, uh, freedom from conflict, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and rejoining their families because that's a big part of it as well. So um, today I am handing over the reins of moderator to Carlos Orbe because I believe it's critically important that, um, you know, we uh, build our next generation of leaders. Uh, and so Carlos will be moderating the session today and leading you along. Um, just uh, please put in the chat, as I always ask, uh, your, your names and um, your organization and maybe even what county or city you're from. It's always nice to know uh, who and where uh, you're from, uh, who you are and where you're from, excuse me, because um, we really wanna be a statewide organization. So with that, Carlos, I hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lemus. And I want to start off by saying this is an absolute pleasure to be hosting uh, this policy series, especially on such a beautiful issue. Uh, complex at times, yes, but I believe that we're all here because we're seeking to find solutions on these complex issues uh, within our country and abroad. And I want to emphasize that uh, today we want to create a safe space and explore these conversations. So on that note, immigration, and I want to provide you some context. Um, immigration, as we're all aware, is a complex situation where the demands of national security and a humanitarian approach are in constant tension. U.S. policy must balance humanitarian aid and the well-being of migrants, particularly that of children and families, with security and safety. Through our discussion today, I believe that we hope to gain our understanding as to how we might prioritize this movement for Maryland in the coming years. Now, as you're all aware, every day in mainstream news, we are bombarded with stories that frame the border and current immigration challenges, primarily from a national security standpoint. The situation on the Southwest border is most often described as a crisis, but in reality, this is nothing new. Uh, what is new is who is crossing the border today. And, uh, you know, it's changed in both in terms of volume and in the countries that they're coming from. And what, and what we're seeing is that the needs of families and children without parents who are referred to as unaccompanied minors are juxtaposed with criminal elements, uh, human traffickers, drug traffickers, weapon smugglers, um, and you know, it's just we're beginning to see that these goods are being moved people back and forth between the United States and the rest of the world, specifically Mexico and Canada. But let's provide some stats and data. Uh, global migration has increased dramatically over the past 10 years. According to the Pew Research Center, uh, by 2020, the number of individuals residing outside their country of origin has surged to 281 million. Uh, marking a staggering increase of 128 million since 1990 and more than tripling the figures from 1970. In 2000, uh, the count stood at 173 million, while in 2010, it had climbed to 221 million. Uh, this continuous upward trajectory underscores a significant trend. As per the United Nations International Organization for Migration, uh, the IOM for short, uh, in that year, 3.6% of the global population lived outside their nation of birth. Uh, remarkably, that growth persisted in 2020, despite the world spread uh, widespread travel restrictions and international movement constraints uh, from the coronavirus pandemic. Now, what is, what's been happening and why are we here having this conversation? In simple terms, the number of displaced people in the world rose to a new high. In 2019, it was 84.8 million, and in 2020, it's 89.4 million. Displaced people are those forced to leave their homes due to conflicts, violence, or, or disasters. 
And what we're seeing is a mounting number of displaced individuals who are increasingly seeking refuge at the U.S.-Mexico border, which is a pivotal entry into the United States. However, evolving circumstance, uh, circumstances along our borders necessitate fresh solutions. Now, we are requiring innovative policy ideas and proposals, both administrative and le legislative, uh, that align with contemporary realities and address the evolving needs of immigration, ensuring it remains a competitive advantage for the United States as a society. Immigrants have long been instrumental in fortifying this nation, and I can't repeat this enough, bolstering its vibrant economy. The focus the media has given Border Patrol agents and law enforcement personnel is but one side of the story. And there is no denying they are expecting a significant increase in apprehensions, placing a strain on their resources. But as we said at the beginning, immigration is a complex issue. It requires the holistic consideration of economic, labor market, and demographic impacts of immigration. Now, I want to emphasize the humanitarian standpoint here. Migrants worldwide grapple with challenges as they flee violence, severe droughts, and economic instability. Presently, we must mitigate the humanitarian crisis by meeting the fundamental needs of these migrants, including shelter, sustenance, medical assistance, and hygiene support, something that was brought up earlier today if you were here. Um, but th this perspective underscores the importance of affording migrants, particularly children, humane treatment and safeguarding them against the push and pull factors compelling them to seek sanctuary in the United States. Now, no matter one's belief on immigration, we can all agree that living in a country or crossing a border without the proper documentation does not strip people of their humanity. In fact, no moral or religious framework holds that people from foreign lands are less deserving of the basic dignities than those fortunate enough to be born in the right place at the right time. It is with these thoughts in mind that we begin our discussion. And it is my pleasure to welcome today's speakers. I will be starting with Ms. Catalina Lima Rodriguez. Uh, she is the founder and director of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant, excuse me, Immigrant Affairs in Baltimore. And now we have Va Val Th Thuanmo, excuse me if I pronounce that wrong, That's Senior the Policy problem. Advisor, and uh, Madeline Martinez, the Assistant Advocacy Director. Both work for Catholic Charities of Baltimore. And then we have Kevin Metacroft, uh, Manager of Field Operations for Global Refuge, uh, formerly known as the Lutheran Immigration and Refuge Service, LIRS. And without further ado, let's meet today's speakers. I ask that please introduce yourselves briefly and tell us a little bit about your role at your organization. Uh, let's start with um, Catalina. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Carlos, for that introduction. I am not able to see anyone, so I hope you can see me. It, it, it is a little, you have a blurry screen on my end. I'm not sure if that is with uh, everyone else. But if you just want to maybe click your video and then click it again, maybe that would help. Yeah, try that twice. Is that better? It it is not, but for the sake yeah. of the show, we can we can hear you still. Yeah, be great. Um, so what I'll do is I'll uh, introduce myself and then I'll um, log off and log back in and see if that uh, it resolves the issue. Good morning, everyone. It's it's great to be here in in community. Uh, my name is Catalina Rodriguez Lima. I am the founding director of the Baltimore City Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Um, we were established in two thousand and fourteen by Mayor Rawlings Blake, and the mission of our office is to promote economic growth, community well-being, and the integration of the 50,000 foreign-born individuals living in the city of Baltimore. Um, in a nutshell, our role is to advise the mayor, city council, city agencies on ways to uh, serve immigrants. We act as a technical assistance provider. I always say that we have two constituents uh, in Lima. We have our residents, but we also have agencies um, to make sure that they have the tools to serve um, the changing demographics. Um, we have a communications and messaging role as well. Uh, we take this very seriously as our folks are not reading uh, The Sun or, the, or watching WJC 13. In that role, we have 
multiple communication channels to ensure that immigrants are informed about uh, services and resources that exist in the city of Baltimore. Um, we also have an advocacy role and we are that squeaky wheel that uh, tries to uh, make sure that as programs and services are being developed, that immigrants are being taken into consideration. Uh, we manage the city's language access program, which provides technical assistance and support to city agencies to make sure that they are able to support people who can't speak English in the city of Baltimore. Um, and finally, a lot of the work that we do is in partnership with community groups. We don't do things in a vacuum. Uh, we have four community advisory groups. We are also constantly out in the community. Uh, we're also looking at national best practices and how they relate to uh, the local realities in Baltimore. I am, uh, again, very grateful to be here, and I look forward to the discussion, and I'm going to log off and see if the issue with the camera is resolved. Thank you. Thank you, Catalina, for that. Thank you for all you do. Uh, Val, let, let's go to you. You're right next on my thing. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Val Tuanmo, the Senior Advisor for Advocacy and Policy at Catholic Charities. Um, so together with Madeline, we are the team that advocates for uh, Catholic Charities clients um, and the agency as a whole uh, in Annapolis and throughout the rest of the year, working to try to make sure that we have policies and um, laws in the state that um, help with providing a variety of services to folks in the Baltimore region. Um, I think I'm primarily here today because I was formerly the director of a Catholic Charities program, which many of you may be familiar with, called Esperanza Center. And I see Valerie is also here from Esperanza, which is wonderful. Um, and for those of you who may not know, the Esperanza Center provides a variety of services, including immigration legal services, um, ESL classes, uh, there's a health clinic, a health and dental clinic, um, informational services and referrals to resources, as well as a program that helps reunite unaccompanied children with their families. And um, it's through that work that I did uh, for several years that I became very familiar with and very involved in uh, the work of helping to assist primarily undocumented immigrants. So happy to be here today. Thank you so much, Val, for that. Uh, Madeline, if you know, I think I see the connection, please. Thank you, Carlos. Good morning, everyone. My name is Madeline Martinez. I have the honor of working with Val uh, at Catholic Charities of Baltimore, an organization that has provided services to Marylanders for a century. Um, it has evolved so much from uh, providing services to orphan children to now working on integrating new Americans into Maryland communities. So it is an honor to be part of her team and to continue to advocate for the most vulnerable, our seniors, our uh, people living in poverty and people who are uh, put on the side because of where we come from. So is as uh, some of you may know me from my previous role with the Latino Caucus, where I work alongside uh, delegates and senators on advocating in the passage of legislation such as the Healthy Babies Equity Act. So I've been on this role for a while and I'm very proud and honor to continue to advocate for our communities. Thank you so much, Madeline. For all those tuning in, I've had the pleasure of working with Madeline and she she is the real deal, as I'm sure everyone in this talk is. Uh, Mr. Kevin, please. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, the Global Refuge, which was formerly LIRS, um, is one of the 10 organizations that's contracted to do refugee re resettlement around the country. Um, and it's been headquartered in Baltimore since 1999. Uh, usually it works through affiliate organizations, not directly. So, so our, our affiliate organization here is uh, Lutheran Social Services, which some folks may be of the national capital area, which some folks may be familiar with. So uh, we have 50 affiliate organizations around the country. Traditionally, um, even though it's headquartered here, the, the organization doesn't do a lot directly in Baltimore. And our office, the Baltimore Welcome Center, which was started last year, um, aims to change that. And uh, there are already a lot of great immigrant service providers in the, in the Baltimore area, as, as you already know, and, and we hope to 
sort of work in partnership with them, which which we're already doing. So um, just a little bit about uh, about what we're currently doing. So you, we can, uh, we're basically two general areas. One would be what we call ORR, Office of Refugee Resettlement Population. So those who have a humanitarian status, uh, so they may be uh, refugees or uh, certain forms of humanitarian parole um, who we serve. So we have programs for uh, Ukrainians on humanitarian parole, Haitians and uh, Cubans. Um, and uh, we are also, I just got in the message, we're, we're uh, planning on starting to do formal refugee resettlement uh, beginning this year, and the, the message just popped up that we have our first arrival scheduled for April fourth, which is which is exciting. So, so we are planning to resettle 150 refugees in the next eight months in the Baltimore metro area. Um, so there's that side of it. The other side would be sort of non ORR populations, um, where. Uh, Obviously, it's a big, bigger challenge because the, they're not eligible. As as all of you know, they're not eligible for um, a lot of the the benefits and services that that refugees and other humanitarian migrants are uh, with humanitarian status. Um, so we are beginning uh, with Esperanza Center and uh, Asylum Women Enterprise. Uh, a project called the, the Case Management Pilot Program, which serves those who have come across the border and been released on electronic monitoring mm. um, to provide wraparound case management and links to services, a legal consult, and mental health services um, if needed, uh, along with trafficking and other screenings. Um, and the aim of this program is to it's a pilot program in five locations around the country funded by uh the department of civil rights and civil liberties and the aim of it is to prove that uh asylum seekers are more likely to attend court gates if they are provided with case management um so uh so great um so i i've been working in refugee and immigrant services in Baltimore for a long time, and and have also worked overseas, particularly in the Middle East and and uh, and the Eastern Europe. So, um, with refugee uh, areas. Um, so happy to be here this morning, and good to see you all. Thank you so much, Kevin. I, I do believe you're going to be adding a, a more unique perspective uh, that we're going to be talking. So thank you. And you, you kind of already dove into my first question here that I kind of want to start with uh, with Miss Miss Val, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, what are the types of legal or bureaucratic barriers that help or hinder uh, your ability to provide effective assistance to Latinos? Uh, and if there are barriers, how do you address them? I will put that question in the chat as well, just so that way everyone's aware of the uh, the, the theme. Well, as I'm sure you know, um, that's a big question. <laughs> um, and yes, there are many, many challenges, barriers, et cetera. Uh, I would say, at least in my experience at Catholic Charities, one of the biggest barriers is a lack of resources and funding. Um, because of course, in order to provide aid and assistance, you need money. Um, you need money for staff. You need money for material resources. Uh, and that is a huge challenge, um, particularly since there typically is no funding coming from the federal government, which means that funds need to come either from the state, from localities, or from private donations. Um, and so I, I would say that that's probably one of the number one challenges and barriers to trying to provide assistance to folks. Um, language access, of course, as has been mentioned before, is a huge barrier. Um, and I know there are typically you know, efforts to try to address that. 
Uh, lots of times the main um, avenue to try to address that may be a language line and there can be real just challenging issues with the use of the language line. Um, you know, number one, having people who are familiar with it, um, making sure that you can find someone with the, la the appropriate language that you're looking for. Um, there are just, as you can imagine, there are problems with trying to be on a phone um, and actually doing translations just creates difficulty. Um, nowadays, I would say this was an issue previously, but even more so post-pandemic staffing in service providing organizations is a huge problem. And um, I think it's actually a problem sort of across industries and everywhere now, and it's just multiplied by the fact that you really hope and want to have folks who are either bilingual or multilingual. So, um, you know, if, if staffing is a problem normally, or not normally, but even with English speaking folks, it's just multiplied, you know, 10 times over when you're trying to find folks who can speak other languages for the people that you're trying to assist. Um, I would say another, certainly another challenge and barrier is misinformation that is out there um, that causes, uh, uh, I guess I will say, well, a lot of anti-immigrant uh, sentiment um, that's just not based in fact. Um, but we had an example of that yesterday at the hearing in Annapolis regarding simply trying to open access to the Maryland Health Benefit Exchange to folks not to provide free care, just to give people the ability to go on the exchange and find information about ins medical insurance. And as we could see from the hearing yesterday, there are still a lot of misinformation that's being put out there about the fact that this is, you know, free care and, and people saying that undocumented folks are going to get free care and, and yet citizens don't get free care. And um, there is just a lot of misinformation everywhere. And unfortunately, it takes resources to try to combat the misinformation. Yeah. So I would say, at least from my perspective, those are probably the main barriers and challenges that I think we encountered uh, in trying to serve clients. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Fallon. Thank you for, for bringing up the Access to Care Act. I'm sure that's going to be brought up in some of the responses uh, as well. But uh, Ms. Catalina, I, I wanted to, to pose that same question to you, but also I wanted to give a framework. Uh, the responses are going to be around two, two to three minutes just for time's sake. Uh, because there are a lot of good questions we want to be able to get to. So, uh, Ms. Catalina, I don't know if you heard the questions, but what are the types of legal and bureaucratic barriers that help or hinder your ability to provide effective assistance to Latinos? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so there are many, uh, but what I will say is uh, the hardest population to serve is the population that is limited English proficient and undocumented. So I'm going to focus on, on that subsector of the population. Um, one I would say is uh, limited resources, as Val mentioned, but for, from a city perspective, the city leans a lot on federal and state funding. Um, so some of the programs that we have are because the city receives a lot of grants from the federal government and the state, and those dollars come with restrictions when it comes to immigrant status. So that what, what that means is that it is our job as an office to advocate for general funds, which are the local funds, which aren't many, uh, as you may have seen, the city's budget is about $4 billion and about two point five billion is for capital improvement projects, leaving only $1.5 billion to, um, to, to fund programs, uh, which the police department takes a big chunk. Um, the second one I would say is our inability to serve immigrants. You know, it's, it's a very uh, specific and technical skill that nonprofit organizations have developed over years and decades and really takes a lot of knowledge, insight, and expertise to be able to serve immigrants. Um, and so we just simply don't have that insight in the city. And even if we hire one person, um, that person is not necessarily going to make a lot of significant changes because these systems are deeply rooted and were not created for us. Hmm. Um, the third one I will say is consistent with that, uh, even when we are able to create something for immigrants, and I'll use language access as one of our, as one of, as an example, 
you know, we and MIMA are there to address technical challenges. So, you know, you can overcome the barrier of language. Great. Here's telephonic interpretation. Here's a list of bilingual employees. The biggest challenge for us is an adaptive challenge is even when senior leadership is on board and supportive of our efforts, if the middle management or the person on the frontline staff um, is resistant to change, uh, that is a process. And that's something that doesn't happen overnight. And it's not something that happens with an executive order from the mayor, right? It's a mm. process that happens over time. The fourth one I would say is uh, providing direct services to immigrants. You know, we always think about at MIMA, I like to think of us as a teenager where um, we are evolving. And so we're looking at what do we do next? Do we provide direct services? Um, which we don't. Uh, we often subcontract with nonprofit organizations. But we do, we do have concerns of if we do direct services for undocumented populations, can we be requested public information acts from the federal government um, in the future, right? That is in the line and it's always in the back of our heads. So do we do it? Do we not do it? How do we do it? And I will say the last one, which is a very wonky one, but it's procurement. Um, we have a terrible procurement process in our city and uh, subgranting with nonprofit organizations can be very challenging because we take forever to pay and smaller nonprofit organizations would not be able to withstand those periods of times. Luckily, we have a fiscal agent outside of the city to overcome those barriers, but, um, but ideally it should not be that way. I completely agree. And thank you so much for, for stating some of those hard truths that we have to be aware of um, in this in this realm of immigration. Now, Mr. Kevin, I wanted to focus uh, on you um, in, in, you know, especially with your realm, you you don't just uh, you, you just don't engage with Central American or Hispanic. Your your range goes even further. So. In the beginning, we spoke about security and humanitarianism. With a focus in the media being so concentrated on security, can you share any specific instances where those concerns have impacted your efforts to provide humanitarian aid to immigrants, uh, both Latino and non? And does that manifest in your work? Um, so I, I think during the Syrian crisis was the most recent uh, where I felt it directly affecting our work. Um, if some of you may remember that our governor even sort of an announced that he didn't want any more Syrians be settled in, in the country. So there was a big wave of fear there. I will say though that we generally somewhat live and work in a bubble. Um, so uh, we don't, besides like the media and, uh, you know, social media and what have you, I, I don't think we necessarily directly experience uh, like anti-immigrant sentiment uh, on, on a daily basis in our work. Um, but I think ultimately it, it happens at a certain a policy level and it trickles down. Um, uh, to, to give you an example, um, you know, uh, stepping back a second, uh, uh, when the Ukrainian crisis started, I was, in, uh, I was in Romania and I met with a family there in a monastery who fled, family of five. And they said, I have a brother in Philadelphia, we just want to go visit him thinking, you know, that's not the way the system works. So it's highly unlikely that they'll, they'll ever come to the U.S. Well, the U.S. carved out an exception with the U4U U program, and we've received nearly 200,000 Ukrainians who, at least until Congress failed to act, were, were eligible for benefits if they came before September 30th, right? Um so they've been thriving, doing well, generally. Uh, and the way the Ukraine crisis is framed is, is basically democracy versus autocracy. And we're fighting on, on the side of autocracy, on democracy. And one of the ways of doing that is by supporting Ukrainians, both here and abroad. If, if you look at uh, the various crises in, in Central America and, and Venezuela, then you're talking more about um, state failure. So a lot of the services that were 
made available to Ukrainians are not available to other populations, right? So I, the lo, Venezuelans and Nicaraguans are eligible for humanitarian parole, but not benefits associated with it. Um, so really, the only Latinos that are that are eligible for humanitarian parole with benefits associated are Cubans, which has been sort of always been the case, right? So classic study says. You know, the old Portes Rumbo study, they, they looked at the three ways that people come into the U.S. One is undocumented, one is, is neutral, they come in with a green card, and the other one is as a refugee or an asylee where they receive benefits attached with it, right? Mm -hmm. And if you control everything and take the same person, the people who receive the benefits will do much better. Mm -hmm. uh, the people who are undocumented will do much worse. And the people who just come in on a green card will be somewhere in between, right? Mm. Um, so a lot of our work with folks that are undocumented or don't have a humanitarian status is really sort of just trying to find resources for them, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and they are treated differently. In a lot of ways, they're fleeing the same things that Ukrainians are, but they're treated differently than than, than other populations, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and I appreciate you shining light on that subject, and I appreciate you bringing up uh, sometimes the the state failures, and I believe that no one has uh, an understanding of the state infrastructure, kind of like Madeline. Uh, so, Madeline, I I wanted to bring up a new question for you. Uh, looking ahead, what do you believe are the most critical steps or measures needed to facilitate more effective humanitarian aid efforts, and how can we balance these security needs? Thank you for that question, Carlos. As we look ahead to the future of humanitarian aid efforts, um, the challenges are becoming more complex, but the key to an effective humanitarian assistance lies between a balance of, in a balanced approach between meeting the current needs, while also making sure that we are ensuring long-term sustainability, which is something that we struggle with in, in the organizations here where we provide services to immigrants, most of the times who are not eligible for federal or state assistance. So first and foremost, what we can do is make sure that we are collaborating and that we continue to coordinate our efforts so that we're not duplicating what each one is doing. This would help us maximize the funds, the limited funds that we have, and would also help us ensure that we are touching uh, on the lives of as many people as possible without duplicating efforts on one in particular. In addition to that, empowering communities is also essential. By investing in the communities that are currently living in our state, we can help uh, bring out the leaders that we have, people like you, Carlos, like Catalina, who, are, who have knowledge, first-hand knowledge of what it's like to live with immigrant fa your immigrant families or to be an immigrant yourself, and then use that um, as a as create channels wh where people can come together and be empowered and get ready so that they can be part of the decision-making process. Because if we have people like us at the table where decisions are made, we, we may be able to figure out creative ways to find resources that other people are not tapping into. So that will be essential as part of the creative aspect of uh, as we move forward with this. And lastly, addressing the root causes of conflict and investing in opportunities for people in developing countries, I think would also help with the humanitarian crisis that we're seeing. If people, if there is no need for people to move, if there are economic opportunities and they feel safe at home, then it's a global economy. There must be a way that we can be creative and, and expand the pie so that people, regardless of where they are, they can access the opportunities without having to move to a new country. Um, so those are the things that I can think of right now. But above all, we need to focus on the current circumstances, utilize the re maximize the resources that we have, address the to address the immediate needs. But also, we need to get in the room and find long term solutions for these issues. I, I completely agree with you, and thank you so much for the work that you're doing on that end, uh, Ms. Val. I I want to include you in that response. Is there anything? Uh, is there anything that you believe that that can be added to what Madeline was stating, or what What are your thoughts on that? Well, 
I think Kevin and Madeline and Catalina actually covered covered a lot of that. Um, you know, I will say probably deep down the biggest problem is the immigration system. Um, and unfortunately, I guess I would say a little bit like the healthcare system, it's so broken at this point that it's almost overwhelming to try to think about how can we go about trying to fix it and make it more effective, efficient, um, and accomplishing the purpose that it was intended to accomplish, which is, you know, America is supposed to be a welcoming nation um, and a place where people can seek refuge and come. Um, and um, so for anyone, I think, who's working in this area, it's just, you have to almost not think about that and just try to focus on those things that you feel that you can do um, and, but yeah, I think Madeline and Kevin pretty much covered it. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Val. Now, Madeline, I, I appreciated what you were saying about get getting, uh, get getting involved and how do we go about that? I think Maryland has a part to play in this. Uh, everyone has a role. So I, I would like to speak, uh, with, with Ms. Catalina, if you would indulge me, uh, despite, the border being a significant part of the focus, we have to redirect our attention more specifically on what states can do to balance our broken immigration system like Ms. Val is stating. Uh, so Maryland, for example, how does that look now? How could it look? Thank you for that question. Um, that is a tough one. Uh, I want to point out that the last major immigration reform act happened in 1986. So you potentially have people who have been in our state for 27 years without any immigrant status. Imagine living, living a life where you are essentially invisible in some cases to this government. Um, you know, because of that, and I know that since then there have been efforts on DACA, TPS, um, deferred action, uh, but in my opinion, these are simply band-aids and they, they are nece not necessarily addressing the real issue uh, since 1986. I think it's time for us to recognize as a collective effort, including government, our reality and the fact that people need to earn an income. And if they don't have status, that's not going to stop them for to feed their families. That's the reason why they came here. I think we can do something creative and think about workarounds for people to earn an income, like promoting the development of LLCs, um, thinking about cooperatives, thinking about ways where people can earn an income, uh, but also contribute to taxes, uh, be part of society. And I don't think we've had an intentional effort um, in, in trying to think about, okay, what are some workarounds? The federal government is not going to do that. Um, what are some workarounds that at the local level, we can ensure that people can earn an income? Um, so that's one idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second idea for states, and this is really the key, uh, but investing in immigration legal services. Um, immigration, I think, I know, I know that immigration legal services is typically not thought of as part of the safety net of human services, but it is the key that opens the door to all services and benefits that immigrants can access. Um, and we simply don't have enough resources. States across the country fund immigration legal services as, as a designated line item. Um, so that's something that we can, as a body, as a group, could advocate uh, to our state, right? And then there's some other conversations across the country which are a little more controversial, but this all stems from the fact that Congress has not done anything. Um, New York City is pursuing this idea of um, providing work permits I'm sorry, New York State is, is thinking of this idea of providing work permits for people who are undocumented, especially new arrivals, where their labor commissioner would grant work permits for people. And then Utah also has a similar, uh, a similar proposal where they, as an as a enterprise, would sponsor immigrants to provide a work permit. Um, these have come up in my conversations, in my national partners' conversations, which are very, very unusual, but this again stems from the fact that um, the federal government hasn't done anything to address our broken immigration system. And these are 
some workarounds or alter alternatives that uh, are being discussed at the national level. Gotcha. Th thank you so much, Catalina. For all those asking questions in the chat, we hopefully, if time permits, we will get to those. I don't want you to think I'm not looking at them. I definitely am. Um, you know, you were talking about, you know, the the kind of like the state intricacies, which I genuinely appreciate. Even on the chat, they were talking about how local county councils, county executives, local boards of education. Madeline, you're directly involved in that realm. So if I were to pose that question to you, uh, for, for, for Maryland, uh, having to redirect attention, how, how does that look now for us towards, uh, the immigration system? So one of the things I heard during the hearing yesterday was that for the last 20 years, Maryland has been taking steps to address the gaps that are left because of our immigration, uh, because of our broken immigration system. One of the things that they mentioned is the the fact that people in Maryland can access driver's licenses uh, without uh, having a social security number. In 2022, we expanded healthcare access to pregnant women regardless of immigration status. And this year we have legislation in process that would expand access, would open up, uh, well, last year we actually have uh, legislation that open access to licenses, healthcare licenses for professionals who have the who meet the education requirements so that they can get licensed to practice their particular specialties in Maryland. However, mm -hmm. um, there's still much more that can be done. Uh, looking ahead in Maryland, we need to continue leading by example, and we need to work on a lot of the misinformation that is going around. And this is touching us right now uh, as we're debating bills such as the one Val in mentioned earlier, the Access to Care Act, which would expand um, opportunities for people who uh, currently cannot purchase health insurance through Maryland Health Connection to pay with their own money. Nobody's giving any subsidy to pay, like just like you buy insurance for your car, to be able to purchase health insurance. If you can afford it, pay for it. And there will be an opportunity to do it. So if this bill passes, that's another step that we can take is one baby step but it's opening opportunities. But we need to do more. We need to further expand access to essential services. We need to advocate at the federal level. That's why elections this year are so important. We have an open Senate seat. So it's important that people are involved in those races that listen to what they would do, what they're planning on doing at the federal level. We need people that can move the needle at the federal level and advocate on behalf of Marylanders because there's only so much we can do in the state. Um, in addition to that, language access continues to be a big issue. And there's only one legislation that I've seen right now that has to do with behavioral health and language access, where people can, uh, providers can get reimbursement for language access services. It hasn't moved, it's still in its early stages. So it's something that I would love to see more legislation when it comes to language access. And this is something that we're struggling with at the local level. And of course, at the state level is even worse. So those are some of the few things that even though the border continues to be a main, the main focus, there are mm. things that as the state we should be doing and also expanding on the work that we've been doing for the past 20 years, while also educating the people that are here to let them know that we're not here to take resources. We're actually here to contribute and show with examples that that's the case. Thank you so much for that. I, you know, language access is a is a theme that we're seeing throughout this conversation, and I appreciate you all for bringing it up in your own ways. It brings me back to when we collaborated, Madeline, when you were with the caucus and we were doing legislative projects. But uh, Mr. Kevin and Ms. Val, um, on the on the theme of partnerships and uh, collaborations, what kinds of partnerships or collaborations with local authorities or organizations should we con uh, consider to balance the humanitarian efforts within the immigrant and Latino communities with needs of public safety? And I'll, I'll, I'll let Ms. Ms. Val answer that or, or Mr. Kevin, whichever you spirits are moved. I'll go start ahead, Val. Oh, I was gonna say, go ahead, Kevin. <laughs> Um, well, it, I would say absolutely, Carlos, what you mentioned, collaborations and cooperation with other organizations, whether they be governmental, nonprofit, um, faith-based organizations, um, those are 
critical in terms of Matt, Madeline mentioned before, we don't really need to be, if we're duplicating efforts, then to be honest, we're not being as efficient or effective. Um, and so any coordination and collaboration that can be done is just helpful all the way around. And I know um, at Catholic Charities, you know, we work closely with Catalina and MIMA and LIRS. Um, we've got grant funding from both those organizations and work together to try to identify needs and then identify resources um, and then figure out implementation. And I think um, those things are critically important. And then as Madeline mentioned also, if we're going to get anything accomplished on a legislative level, we have to be joining together and speaking with one voice, one strong voice, to make sure that the elected officials understand how important this is and that there is a large contingent out there that is interested in making something happen. And we can only do that if we're uh, cooperating and coordinating our efforts with each other. Excellent. Mr. Kevin? So I, I, this may not directly answer your question, but I just want to piggyback on what Val said. Um, Traditionally, um, we live in, we live in the, the wealthiest state in the union. Um, and traditionally, uh, my type of organization is not very good at doing state level advocacy, right? I, I can't tell you how many times I, I've talked to Sarbanes office or Mikulski's office back in the day. And you're just talking, you're just preaching to the converted, right? And it, there was no result. They were going to vote for you anyhow, right? Uh, but when it came to state level, I mean, they're really in the realm of the fact that the national level government is is just deadlocked. I, they really can fill in a lot of gaps. We just need to ask them to, right? I I mean, it's it's like. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt used to say, like, I agree with you, now make me do it. We need to make the state government provide resources for immigrant and refugee services. Even for refugee services, Utah has a generously funded refugee resettlement program that lasts two years of case management. We, we've got 90 days here, right? Just because we haven't asked them. And I, let me step back a second, though. So um, I did talk about our sort of refugee humanitarian arrivals, non-humanitarian arrivals. One thing I should have brought up is traditionally we think of people that, with refugee status not as being Latino generally, with the exception maybe of Cubans. Um, one thing the Biden administration is doing is shifting sort of the, the refugee infrastructure to Central America, to South America, um, and that you'll see many more formally resettled uh, refugees coming from Latin American countries, right? As sort of one policy solution, right? To, you know, what's happening in, in Central America and, and, and South America. So um, I, I do think sort of uh, the, the two realms are, are sort of coming together, right? Um, and when it comes to advocacy. And it, they're coming together from our. So back to, I, I think most of things around security are really local. Um, so working with uh, the police departments, which isn't always e easy as anyone has ever done, but it's it's a conversation you, you keep have to have it, have, have to happen. I, I talked to someone a couple of months ago, I'm not gonna name who or the jurisdiction, who is a higher level in the police department uh, it's not Baltimore City, and he was trying to say that you need to speak English to drive a car in Maryland, and I was sort of gobsmacked that that someone that's been working in law enforcement that long still believes that, right? Um, and then that's when you get into some serious issues. If anyone's old enough to remember Amadou Diallo, I mean, we really need to 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 sort of keep the conversations going with, with law enforcement, even though it's not, we come from completely different worlds and it's not always easy. 
With, and thank you for bringing up that that other element. I, I'm sure that the Miss Catalina or Miss Madeline would love to weigh in on that in the last five minutes here that we have uh, partnerships and collaborations. Would you be able to to name any or some that you've already participated in? No, what we'll start with with uh, Miss Catalina. I mean, our life is a partnership. We would not be able to do anything alone. We try to put ourselves in the center as the institutional glue that brings government, nonprofits, philanthropy, uh, private partners, and really anyone who's willing to, to advance the well-being of immigrants in our city. Um, we lean on the shoulders of those doing the work, and we often call them our tentacles um, and, and, and try to be that platform that unites us for a cause, for a, a particular issue. Um, mm -hmm. But just off the top of my head, everyone who's in this call, obviously, um, but all the nonprofits that work in our city, um, so many to so many to, to list, and I don't want to leave anyone out. All good, all good, understandable. And uh, Miss Madeline, please. So the same here, um, none of the work that we do could be possible without the support of everyone, each and every one of you in this call. And But we need to continue to work together, unify our voices and to support one another. At Catholic Charities, we are a large organization with various services. Um, and one of them is services for immigrant communities. And I know that arm of Catholic Charities is working closely with MIMA, working closely with other entities to ensure that they are providing the resources that are needed the most without duplicating efforts that are currently happening. But we, as you know, Carlos, there is much more to do um, that we, but we need to come together uh, in order to get it done and to come out. Uh, yesterday, many of you were at the hearing in Annapolis. It was good to see so many of you um, putting ourselves out there, getting the word out and speaking up for those who need to be heard. And I'm counting, we continue to count on you and each and every one of you to come out and support the efforts at the state level. And, and if you're able to also advocate at the federal level or the local level, go for it, but take this information and use it. Because right now we're running out of time and we need to make sure that this is done now. Thank you Can so I much. Can I just say one more thing, Carlos, yeah. that I just wanted to like elevate um, and it's relevant because, you know, I am government and I have an agenda. Um, and I think it's really important that a, an external body, a united body exists outside of government because I like to think that I have the best, I, I care about immigrants and that I will always do what's right and be on the right side of history, but I don't know who's coming after me and I don't know who will be the mayor in 10 years. So there, I think it's healthy to have a group that's outside of MIMA. So if anybody wants to be an institutional glue or platform outside of MIMA, I really encourage you to do that. Um, and shameless plug what I'll have your attention. Um, MIMA was created in 2014 by a mayor, but it could also be dismantled by a, another mayor. Um, so we are not institutionalized in local government. Well, the mayor introduced legislation last year to make MEMA permanent. Um, and we have a public hearing on March 20th at 1 p.m. If you want to support MEMA and the work that we do and making sure that it remains regardless who's in office, I invite you to join us on that date. We're creating a toolkit with letters of support templates social media graphics, and um, if you want to support us, be there. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Catalina. And it's important to spread that uh, that network. Before I, I hand the reins over to Dr. Uh, Lim again and uh, Veronica. Catalina, would you mind putting that information about your hearing <laughs> mm -hmm. in the chat so that we can copy paste and send notes? <laughs> yes. Okay. Sorry, Carlos. Go ahead. No, the only thing I was going to say is on on the similar note to events and everything, I, I Kelly Umana, uh, who works for MOU as well, just uh, in the spirit of language access, uh, they are having a, um, a, a best practices in improving language access for Latino communities. It's in the chat. The Zoom link is there. Uh, it's going to be March 6th from 12 to 1.30. Um, but, you know, one thing I want to say, and I want to thank all of the speakers for really being here and taking time out of your day. I know that me at MOU, I'm trying to begin campaigns where we normalize the everyday hero. And I think that's what each of you are and each of you embody in your work. So thank you so much for that. And uh, Dr. Lemus, uh, Director Veronica. 
please. I would love for you guys to chime in. Uh, thank you, Carlos. Uh, congratulations. Um, I uh, I can rest easy now. I can just hand this work over to you. <laughs> Bravo. Well done. Um, and thanks to you, all of my speakers, um, our speakers. Uh, you have, I appreciate your candidness and, um, and your, uh, just what you're doing. It's incredible. And when you start to piece it together like this, and I see it hand in hand, um, to your point, Val, it, it makes us stronger. And and that's what our, our motto is, is juntos podemos mas, together we are stronger. So um, I, I it really resonated with me. Um, Catalina, uh, you're you're my shiro. Um, at, nice to meet you, Kevin. Uh, and Madeline, of course, who's who's been uh, working with us side by side for a long time. I really appreciate all of you. Veronica, um, would you like to wrap up? I don't know that I need to. I mean, you guys killed it. Killed it. Um, I, I don't know if you guys, I mean, we have 50 people on the line today and you know we do this monthly and the access, uh, the talent that we have is exceptional. So to all the people that say, you know, there's there's no unity in the Latino community, there's no expertise, there's no subject matter experts. <laughs> I laugh at you. <laughs> just look, look across, look across the Zoom. So no, I simply just want to uh, piggyback on what's been said across the entire session. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's many, many pieces. And we can't simply slice off immigration or slice off housing or slice off health. As you heard, there was a lot of crossing over. And um, we do share a lot of the challenges from all of our immigrant communities. So I think it's wise for us to continue to build allyships. Um, and I think we need to do what Catalina said. We do run the risk of being dismantled if we fall in certain buckets. If we were created by government, uh, as we've seen with the Supreme Court recently in lots of uh, overturned decisions, we can be dismantled, taken away. So there does need to exist, uh, a body needs to exist outside. That's what MLU is. That's what Maryland Latinos Unidos, United, Unidos, United. Uh, that's why we exist, because we in Maryland are about 30, 40 years behind the rest of the country. I saw some chats about California. We don't have structures like California, New York, Florida, Texas, because we didn't have this, the community, the, the numbers. We're getting there. So what I implore you to do is let's actually show up. Val I'll set it. We don't need to be duplicating efforts. I don't need to be doing what Catholic Charities is doing. I just need to show up and support them. I don't need to imitate Mima. I need to show up and support her. So my ask is let's be smart. There's never enough money. So why are we doing things twice? And you know what? We do it twice. We're not doing it well. <laughs> let's go to the expert. Mima, Catholic Charities. Let's be smart. So my plea today, as it is every single time, is speak up, participate, join, show up, ask for help. But you got to show up. So don't be asking if you're not supporting. That's the other thing. You have uh, established communities. They know that. So they don't show up with their hand out asking for support my program, give me funding, give me help, unless they're part of it. So show up for us. Become members. Show up for these meetings. Speak up. Sign testimonies. Fill out things. Share your activities so we can amplify them. At the end of the day, our work is bigger than us. It doesn't have... Catalina, Vals, Gabriel, Gabriela, or Carlos names on it. So let's be smart. So just ending the day with the fact that it's leap year coming up. Happens once every four years. It's really, really special. So let's do something magnificent, right? Collaborate strategically with one another. We already do that. Como dijo Catalina, we don't exist without each other. So juntos podemos más. Gabriela, I stole it. Muchas mm -hmm. gracias. You didn't steal it. It's all yours. It's all of ours. Uh, thanks, all of you. Uh, we're at time. Um, thank you for being with us. Um, feel free to reach out. I put mine in. Uh, sorry, Carlos, I took the liberty of putting your email in the chat. <laughs> I hope I got it correct. <laughs> uh, email us. Let us know um, how we can be helpful. And um, also, um, you know, um, do join us because um, this, uh, I'd like to think of us, yes, we're a, we're a think tank and, and a, we're a think and do tank, but we're also part of a movement and we're proud to join hand in hand with all of you uh, to move our collective agenda forward. So gracias a todos. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, 
next month uh, will be our discussion will be around education uh, on March 21st. So uh, save it on your calendars if you haven't already.